welcome all of you who are present in this room and those especially who join us online. Welcome to Pleasant View Worship at 11 o'clock. My name is Barbara Farmer, and since we don't all know each other, I would like for us to introduce ourselves on the count of three. Call out your name. One, two, three. Now we know each other. <laughs> we are so blessed uh, today to have guests from Iowa, Michigan, and Canada. So welcome to this uh, week of international youth service here in Abingdon in Southwest Virginia. We hope your stay with us is, is exciting and, and uh, welcoming and productive. So all of you home folks, make these folks feel at home and welcome them. And you have a prayer partner in this group somewhere, I'm sure. So sometime between now and the time they leave, please find them and let them know you're praying for them. I have some announcements. If you would, take that little notebook that's at one end of your pew or the other and, and record your attendance with us so we will know who was here. And if you have a change in your demographic information, please include that so Kathy in the, in the church office will be able to update her records. I would like to tell you that we're having a problem with our email uh, server, particularly Gmail. If you have a Gmail email account, you're not getting emails from us on a regular basis. Those are being blocked for some new Google security reason, and we're working on it trying to get that issue resolved. We understand from the IT people that it's a setting that has to be changed. So, you know, that's way above my pay grade. So if you understand all those things, um, you're a whole lot smarter than the average the average uh, person around here. But hopefully we will get it resolved and we'll be able to get information to you. If you have emails other than Gmail, most likely you are receiving the emails that go out from the church office. So... Um, Please help with serve as you can. Rob Hagerman is in charge of food. If you're able to, to uh, volunteer during meal times and meal prep or, or ever how you are able to volunteer, just seek Rob out. He's the chef in the kitchen, and he will be more than happy to give you a place to, to serve. The pictures are here. They're in the narthex. If you want to get there on the table to, to my right, Please pick those up. And also, I want to say a big thanks to this congregation on behalf of Carly Jarvis. She did a lemonade stand here a couple of weeks ago, if you remember, to raise money for the Isaiah 17 house. And she, due to your generosity, she was able to raise $7,000. And she, she says she will divide those proceeds. <laughs> existing Isaiah House in Tennessee, in Sullivan County, and then the one under construction in Washington County, Virginia. So she plans to divide the proceeds between those two. Okay, I think that's all the announcements I have. Dale, do you have anything? If you would stand for our call to worship. I would like, before we re responsibly, I would like to read to you a scripture that, that was that was um, revealed to me this morning in a very special way at home when I was looking, searching for a word, a word for today. And from uh, Proverbs 8, I found this, where God says, Listen to me, God says through his, his servant, Listen to me, for I have important things to tell you. Everything I say is right. My words are plain to anyone with understanding, clear to those with knowledge. Choose my instruction rather than silver and knowledge rather than pure gold. For wisdom is far more valuable than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with that. Join me in our responsive reading. Children of God, you are welcome here. All, all of who you are, even your regrets and failings, is welcome here. Many of us find it easy to recognize our goodness and difficult to notice our sins. Others of us live under a shroud of guilt and shame. 
believing we could never be good enough to receive the fullness of God's love. However you enter this place, know this, you are loved, accepted, and called. May God's love draw us to honest confession, God's acceptance assured us of the work of grace in our lives, and God can call and God's call compels us to live in grace. And now let us worship in song. Christians, I ask you, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. Sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now greet your neighbors.
a mission trip that we took to Malawi, Africa, just a couple of weeks ago. But first of all, I would like to say, uh, even though it's already been done, welcome to you guys. I've already welcomed you, but it is so good to have these guys from Michigan and Iowa and Ontario with us. And I know our church family is going to make them feel welcome this morning. So glad to have you guys here. So some of you may, some of you may know that my brother Steve is a missionary in Malawi, Africa. And I've been leading teams over there now for a couple of years. And we go, and we went just a few weeks ago. There were 16 of us. And we do things like building playgrounds, and we built a fence, and we do children's ministry, and we do all these things. So when we went back in January this year, we got to do something that we had not done before. And that is that we got to distribute corn, or they call it maize. Uh, People in the country of Malawi are literally starving. To death. And so uh, January was my first experience with that. And we, we took some money over in January, and we bought some uh, several tons of corn, and we distributed it. And I did not realize what a need, what a, a crucial need that was until I was, I was there. I was sort of standing back and watching this first maize distribution we did in January. And there was, uh, what we do, we take a tarp. And we pour out these big bags of corn, and we divide that into five-gallon bucket sizes. And we give uh, a five-gallon bucket of corn to uh, widows and to vulnerable families. Those are the poorest of the poor that have been picked out. And that's a month's wages uh, worth of corn for them. And so we give them that corn, and it provides some food for them. Corn is their, their staple. Many people eat one meal a day if they get that, and oftentimes it's only cornmeal that they make into a thing called enzima. And so as we were doing this in January, I noticed a little boy over on the side uh, where just a few kernels of corn had fallen on the ground. And this guy had a little broken ball of some sort, like a little soccer ball that was broken open that he had from somewhere. And he was picking up these kernels of corn out of the dust that we were just walking over. You know, we just thought they were we, we paid no attention to it at all. But this little boy is picking up those kernels of corn and taking those home. And that's how hungry those people are. And it began to dawn on me just what a, a, a true ministry that is. So we started a thing uh, when we came back called Maze for Malawi. And this church went above and beyond. The DBS uh, sponsored that too this year. And we raised $6,300. And we were able to buy many, many tons of corn, and we got the experience handing that out. So I just wanted to say thank you uh, to everyone who helped with that. And I encourage you, we're, we're still collecting money on that for the next time we go. And thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to go and to be the literal hands and feet of Christ to people who, uh, who don't know Christ. This is in a largely Muslim area, uh, 98% Muslim. Uh, one of the churches that we work with over there is building a new secondary school, Christian school, where the gospel will be preached, and it's right next to a mosque. And so they need, need our prayers, they need our support, and uh, the gospel is advancing there, and it's, a, it's an amazing thing. But we're feeding hungry people. I just wanted to thank you for that, and uh, we'll do it again. Okay, thank you very much.
since we uh, go to this part of our worship service, and really and truly, the most important thing that we can do is pray. I think that God could ever just shake us to our core and, and cause us to realize the power that He has put in our hands, and that is power in prayer. We would be different people, and we would live in a different world. We have several ongoing prayer concerns that are listed on the back of your bulletin, and I appreciate the fact that many of you take take this list home and pray over these folks on a regular daily basis. And I, for one, want you to know how very important it is to me, and I feel Bill would, would ditto that, that, to know that God's people are praying for God's people. And we need to pray for, for situations in our world. We need to pray for this team this week as they go out on, on mission uh, projects in this area, that they will be safe, that God's Spirit will protect them, and that's part of our prayer. We have those listed for special prayer, and I will name those right now. Virginia Brown, Harold Lambert, Doug Harmon, Beth Henningson and family, Kim Nichols, Steve Fields, Vicki Lewis, Calvin Walsh, Kathy Matthews, Susan Nielsen and Anna Walter, the Jamaica Mission Trip, uh, Regina left, I think, yesterday going to Jamaica. Gail Butler, Pat Burton, Billy Moretz, Rocky Blevins, our serve team. And in addition, we would like to remember the family of Gerald Kaiser, who, who died this past week. And those, those members among us are Audrey Barnes, Clyde Shirley, and Kay Kaiser. Are there any other special requests that you would like to call out? John Cole. What about a special request known as to you and God? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for the evidence of prayer that we see daily if our eyes are open. We come to you and we plead, and then so much of the time, Father, we just turn our backs and go away and forget all about the prayer and what we have begged you for and what we have promise to do for you, and then you show us, you show us in a mighty, mighty way that you are listening and that you are active in your world and that you are changing lives. Father, I thank you for the healings that we have witnessed. I thank you for, for prayers that are answered when we had no idea what we were praying for. Lord, how you engineer circumstances in our lives, and then you show us what you've done. And for that, we are so grateful. I thank you for the work to be done here this week and in this community, and I thank you for the praise that will come out of that. So keep our people safe, Father. Keep these teenagers and their leaders safe. And Lord, may we go away rejoicing when, it, when the end of the day comes. Thank you for the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples so many years ago when they, when they came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And you said, pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And if our ushers will come, we will worship in yet another way.
Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Your grace is more where grace is found, is there you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Oh God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need my righteousness. Oh God, how I need my one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Good morning, friends. How are we? Okay, we changed the list up right here. Come on, Dad. Yeah, we got 
I start to read it, and I said, I did. Well, so I, how is everybody? Good. I have a really hard question for you. Are you ready? Have you ever messed up or done something wrong? No. Does anybody want to tell us what that was? No. Nobody wants to talk about their mess up. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, so this morning we are going to talk about David. Do you remember David? It's done. Yeah. It's okay. What about, remember he was a shepherd boy and he took on Goliath, the big giant, and then he becomes king. He writes a bunch of songs and they're in the Bible. Yeah. Really cool guy. Excellent. Well, you know what? He's in my Bible too. Perfect. Well, David is going to mess up in our scripture lesson this morning. And he's going to mess up big. But just like, it doesn't really matter how exactly he messes up. But you know. Well, hold on. I want to tell you what David did to this morning, okay? You ready? So David messed up. And instead of saying, I messed up, he tried to cover it up. He took that sin and he tried to cover it up. And he tried to trick people. And he lied about it. And he even gets a guy murdered because he won't be honest about his mess up. Well, I know it is really bad. So, did David handle that in the right way? Is that what we should do with our sins? Should we just try to cover it up and pretend like our mess ups didn't happen? No. When we break God's rules, should we just cover it up? It's okay. We'll just cover it up. We'll lie about it. Nobody will know. Is that a good way to handle it? Yes. What should we do with our sin? Instead of covering it up, what should we do? Who should we tell? God. We should tell God. We should tell God. And if we tell God, He does already know. But what do we need to ask Him for, though? Do we ask Him to forgive us? Yes. Well, He does know when we mess up. He knows about our sin. But we need to ask God to forgive us. And if we ask God to forgive us, what does He do? He forgives us. Because did Jesus already take the punishment for our sin? All of our mess ups. Jesus already paid for them. He already took the punishment. And where did He take the punishment for our sin? When did that happen? On the cross when He died for us. Exactly. So now when we mess up, we don't need to cover it up. We ask God to forgive us. And when we talk to Jesus about our sin and we ask him to forgive us, do you know what he does with it? Well, hold on, this is really good, I promise. I promise. What does Jesus do with our sin? What? He throws it away. It's gone. He erases it. And the Bible tells us he doesn't even remember it anymore. Read it on by excellent. He threw it on the cross. Good job. So when we sin, we need to ask for forgiveness. Would you guys pray with me this morning? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your forgiveness. Remind us to ask for it when we mess up. We love you, Lord. Amen.
Well, the kids may have said it better in their sermon than I'll say it in mine, but uh, yes, the kids are correct. That story is in their Bible, and it's in mine too, and we're going to read it this morning. And then the other thing they were right about is God already knew He did it. Why didn't He just confess up to it? Um, so uh, probably a, a very good uh, starting point for what we're going to talk about today. It's, it's the story of David and Bathsheba. And so if you are able, I invite you to stand as we show reverence to the reading of Scripture. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will never do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Please be seated. We love our soap operas, don't we? When I was just a kid and I would spend summers at my grandparents' house, we would get out of bed real early in the morning and my grandpa and I would go out and work in, in his uh, several gardens. And my grandmother, Mamma, would uh, be in the house doing her thing. But about the middle of the afternoon, everything stopped. They turned on the air conditioning in the living room. They turned on the TV, and Mamma watched her story. Now, some of you know what that is. Mamma watched her stories, and I mean, if you interrupted her stories, it better be for a really good reason. And I noticed that my grandpa was being drawn into the stories too, and every once in a while, even this little boy 
got drawn into the story. And then I remember as a college student, General Hospital was, was the big soap opera, and everything on the UT campus stopped in the afternoon while General Hospital was on. Nobody would sign up for a class in that time block because everybody was either at their frat house or their, their dorm lobby or wherever they were watching General Hospital. Well, the scripture passage that we have in front of us today kind of would be a good soap opera plot. And so I started to call it the young and the restless, but at this point, David had been king long enough that maybe it's more appropriate to call it the old and the restless. But I want us to think about the story today And more than hearing a story about a king who stepped out of line centuries ago, I hope we'll hear a story in the Scriptures that speaks to one part of human nature that has not changed one bit during the time from King David until 2024. We humans are vulnerable to temptation. The story is set very simply. It says in the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab. Joab was his general, and David sent Joab and his mighty men, his circle of 30 men who had been with him since his days in the desert, and and they were his military leaders. And, and David sent them to do war with the Ammonites, but David stayed in Jerusalem. You see, what had happened is that as David had gotten older, his men had convinced him that it really didn't make sense for him to go into battle and possibly be injured or even killed in battle, that his leadership was far more important at that point than having somebody else swinging a sword And so David stayed in Jerusalem while his general Joab and and all the army of Israel went and made war against the Ammonites. David was walking on the rooftop of the king's palace late one afternoon when he spotted a woman baby. Now, the story is told in Scripture without reading a lot into it, but but if you're like me and have heard the story told time and time and time again, we preachers always read our suppositions into it. But all the story says is that David saw Bathsheba taking a bath And he noticed that she was very beautiful. And having been in a locker room or two in my life, I'm sure David went out to the guys and said, Who is that gorgeous woman out there? And they said, Well, we don't know, but we'll find out for you. And so they went and found out that he was eyeing a woman who was married to one of his mighty men, Uriah the Hittite, one of the men who had been loyal to him back during the civil war between David and Saul, one of the men who had put his life on the line several times for David, one of his loyal soldiers. And that woman was one of his loyal soldiers' wife and and that loyal soldier was out risking his life for king and country while the king was eyeing his wife for different purposes. And so one of the guys said, do you want me to go get her? And David said, yeah, go get her. And he brought her to the palace. And David invited her into the palace. Folks, there's, there's where 
the breakdown certainly moves from possibly a breakdown to a critical breakdown. When sin knocks on the door, you don't open the door and invite it in. You see, we're talking about a particular sexual sin today, but the truth of the matter is that Satan Taylor makes temptations for you. And Satan Taylor makes temptations for me. And what tempts you and what tempts me are usually two very different things. But temptations come wrapped up to be presented to the person who is vulnerable. And one of the things that we can do to fight temptation is to keep distance between us and those things that that we are vulnerable to. You don't stock the liquor cabinet, cabinet in an alcoholic's home, do you? You don't bring a box of donuts and put in the preacher's office when you have a diabetic preacher. Don't ask me how I know that. Uh, But, and in David's case, a man with multiple marriages and multiple concubine relationships, you don't open the door and invite temptation in. And yet, he did. It's been interesting during my years of, of Bible study as a, as a kid and a teenager. I did a lot of my own Bible study and, and the old commentaries all put this on Bathsheba. It was her fault. She shouldn't have been out there bathing where the king could see her. And then as I got to seminary and started reading other literature, well, it was her fault, but it was his fault. Takes two to tango. Then later, as as people began to look at at power in relationships and the balance of power, it began the the commentaries began to tilt and began to say, no, David was the one who held all the power in this relationship. So this was not two people committing adultery. This was the king committing sexual assault, or that other four-letter word. But notice the Scripture gives it to us in the way it gives it to us because nobody thought about power dynamics back in the 10th century B.C., it just tells us the story. David invited her in, and the next thing it says is that he lay with her, he sent her on her way, and then she sends word back to him, I'm pregnant. What are you going to do, David? I'm pregnant. And so David immediately hatches a plan. I mean, you don't get to be king by by not thinking fast on your feet. He brings Uriah home and says to him, give me an update on the war. Uriah gives him an update on the war. And then David says, now go home to your wife and wash your feet. Without me getting really graphic, folks, the wash your feet was euphemism in that day for, you know, make sure that, that the deed happens. And so... David goes to bed satisfied that he's going to be able to weather this storm because it's just going to look like that that Bathsheba had an eight-month pregnancy and and Uriah was the father and everything was going to go well except Uriah didn't go home. He said, how can I go home and and enjoy the comforts of my wife while everybody else is out in the tent on the battlefield? That wouldn't be right. So the next night, David gets him drunk. I'll get him home this way. 
but it didn't happen again. Now feeling the pressure, David sends him back, carrying his own Uriah, carrying his own death warrant. David sends a letter to his general, get this guy killed. Notice how one thing stacks on another. So often we hear in the media, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. David tried to cover up the crime and in so doing committed a greater crime. You see, one of the first lessons when you find yourself in the hole is you stop digging. David kept digging and digging and digging. And what do we do when we find ourselves in a hole? Do we not often keep digging? When the reality is that it's only going to get worse. Three words that will save you so much heartburn and heartbreak and may you lengthen your life. Three words. I messed up. If David had used those three words, Uriah would have been alive. Everybody would have talked about the scandal until another scandal broke and then that would have been it. But because David covered it up, it began to foster resentment and rebellion in his own family. And the natural consequences of sin carried between his sons. One of his sons ended up raping his half-sister. One of his sons ended up rebelling against David and attempted to overthrow him. David never knew a minute's peace. After this incident with Bathsheba, his entire life was spent like the little guys in the circus walking behind the elephant, always having to sweep it up because Something else has gone wrong. He could have stopped. He could have said, I was wrong. He ultimately confessed. He ultimately was forgiven, but you see, he set so many things in motion that would not be stopped. What about our temptations? What are they going to set in motion? What have they set in motion in our lives? I think about all of the people through the years that I've sat down with usually in a hospital room or sometimes in a, in a hospice bed in their own home. And they will say, I did this to myself. If I could just rewind everything and do this over, I wouldn't be where I am today. Now, if you're like me, you've heard this story a lot. It's easy to take out David and and, and uh, kind of beat him up for his sin, but the truth of the matter is we, we all can relate because we all have our weaknesses. The truth of the matter is we've all dug, dug ourselves holes at times that we wish we had never started digging. 
The truth of the matter is we know our weaknesses all too well and all too often we have been willing to open the door and invite sin into our hearts. Here's the good news. Want some good news? God knew that we were going to be this way. And God offered us forgiveness. Just as David confessed his sin in, in what is now our 51st Psalm, and said, Against you and you only have I sinned and, and done this thing in your sight, so too we can confess our sin. And the New Testament says, When we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do we really want to live under the cloud and burden of sin? Dragging our past like a weight tied around our waist? Or do we want to join the group that sang this morning, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how oh, I need you. I really do have good news today. There is victory in Jesus. There is victory in Jesus. You don't have to live that way, folks. There's victory. Stand and sing our closing hymn.
so happy to have our friends from Serve with us this week, and it's it's just an important part of the mission arm of this congregation that we be given the privilege to host you, make yourselves at home this week, and, and do the work of the Lord. Now, if you would receive this benediction, go now in His peace. May the grace of Christ, our Savior, and the Father's boundless love and the Holy Spirit's favor rest upon us from above, both now and even forevermore. Amen.